Good afternoon, all. Um, welcome to the, uh, the Jasmine User Conference for 2023. My name is Adrian Hines. I'm Director of Jasmine, and it's, it's my pleasure to welcome you here at RAIL for what I hope will be a, a really interesting and useful couple of days talking about Jasmine and, and some of the things we're doing with it. So in, in terms of um, introduction, I was thinking a little bit about how we've got to, to where we are with Jasmine. Um, and so I think Jasmine's been in existence for a bit over 10 years now. I think it's fair to say over that period, the development of Jasmine has been sort of incremental year on year. Um, and as well as the, the development of the, the technical side of things and the services being incremental, alongside that, the user community has grown steadily over that period as well, both in terms of the size of the user community, but also in terms of its breadth to the point where the user community now spans pretty much the full breadth of NERT's environmental science work. Um, and I think one of the reasons that Jasmine has been successful in growing in that way is because of the close link to the user community and the fact that the, the philosophy has been trying to be proactive in, in understanding what the user community needs and responding to those needs. Um, and as a result of that growth, we're now in the point where Jasmine is a reasonably large scale system um, and it's very much sort of embedded as part of NERC's infrastructure that supports the environmental science research in the UK. Um, and more broadly than that, with, in the context of UKRI discussions around digital research infrastructure, I think it's fair to say that Jasmine's a, a sort of key element of that overall UK digital research infrastructure landscape. So it's, it's become a system that's, that's really sort of well-established um, and has a key place in that infrastructure. Um, as I said, at the heart of that is our ability to, to understand what users need and respond to that. But of course, over the last few years, that's been hampered to some extent because of COVID and, and our, the fact that we haven't been able to have events like this where we can get together with the user community. So I think it's really welcome, actually, that we, we do have the opportunity to get together, to spend a couple of days focused on, on Jasmine so that we can share with you some of the things that we've been doing and what we're planning next so that you can share with us some of your reflections on, on how Jasmine's working for you, what we could improve, and, and what you want us to do next. Um, so with that in mind, the, the main aims of the, the next couple of days really are to firstly strengthen the community um, through sharing experience and expertise. And that's not only through us understanding what you as a community need, but also amongst yourselves in the community, sharing, uh, sharing with each other some of your experience and thoughts on that. Um, getting some feedback from you as users about uh, what, what we should be doing um, and an opportunity to dig into that feedback a little bit more deeply than, than we would otherwise get. So by being together and discussing, uh, really getting, getting to the heart of some of that feedback. Um, but also discussing the question of where, as a community, you think we should be heading in future with Jasmine. So what is it that we should be? more detail the things that we need to do to really make that a reality um, from the point of view of the community. So with that in mind, we have allowed plenty of time for discussion in the sessions. And so please do be forthcoming with your views. Please let us know what you think um, and ask any questions that you have, because it's that user feedback and that interaction that's really important to us as we try and move Jasmine forward. Um, in terms of the agenda, for the next couple of days, hopefully you've all seen this. We'll, we'll start with an update on where we are with Jasmine. And then we've got the first of two user highlight sessions, which is an opportunity for some of our users to share with you the things that they've been doing on Jasmine. Um, and then after that session, we'll go back over to CR12 and 13 for some refreshments. And then we've got a discussion session around feedback and future requirements. Um, and then we'll come back over here to the coffee lounge outside where there'll be some drinks and opportunity for some networking followed by something to eat later on this evening. Um, and then tomorrow morning, we'll reconvene for a nine o'clock start. Um, we'll have a look at some, some of the new things that are coming on Jasmine, some more user highlights, and then again, back over to CR 12 and 13 for a discussion around net zero and environmental sustainability. 
And we'll aim to finish by one o'clock tomorrow. And for those that can hang around after that, there'll be an opportunity to have some lunch before you disappear off. Um, so that's really all, all I wanted to say to get us started, other than to say the team are here um, and around. So they're here both to answer your questions and, and deal with any problems that you might have, but they're also here to learn, to listen to what you as a community have to tell us and to learn from that. So please do use the opportunity to share your thoughts with us. We really do value your input um, and, and hope to hear from you over the next couple of days. Um, and with that, just hope that you find the, the conference enjoyable and useful and uh, make the most of the time here. And that, that was all I was gonna say. And I will hand over to Matt for a Jasmine update. Hey. <clears throat> so thanks very much, Adrian. And uh, yeah, it's uh, great to, to, to be here and uh, see so many of you here. Oops. Great stuff. Um, for our Jasmine conference. Um, this is going to um, take you through uh, a little bit of a recap of um, the purpose of Jasmine, just to remind maybe uh, some of you new to Jasmine, just to, to remind yourselves what it's all about. Um, to go through some of the, the recent changes that have happened on the platform, um, look at the current state of uh, both the, the infrastructure and um, some of the projects that are going on. But actually, that's also why, why you guys are here to tell us about that as well. Um, and as Adrian has said, an opportunity for, an opportunity for some, some good discussions about where things should go in the future. Um, but uh, I thought I'd start with um, uh, the elephant in the room, if you like, because um, uh, we do need to confront it head on. It seems to be doing that to us. So um, obviously, uh, you'll have noticed um, that Jasmine hasn't been working um, this, this last few days. Uh, that's not to say the team has been working very, very hard. Um, so the infrastructure team over in SCD has been um, uh, doing its, its, its level best to, to get everything um, back up for you. Um, so the current status is that uh, all the electrical work um, happened successfully over the weekend. And according to the sort of um, the, the plan that the, the team has put together, um, the sequence of, of restarts of various subsystems has been sort of happening over the past few days. And I think we're now at the stage where um, some, some things aren't, well, most of it is now working again, um, apart from the, the Slurm scheduler. Um, so uh, I won't sort of, we won't open the floodgates just yet, but what we'll do is during the afternoon session, I'll gather a bit more information and, put a, and hopefully put an, um, an update out um, but if your basically if your work doesn't involve um, Lotus and the Slurm scheduler, um, then in theory you should be able to get back on the system before too long. Um, I'm not sure it's quite open just yet, but um, so that's really good news. And uh, I think our thanks are due to the, the infrastructure team. So James and Christina are here from the SCD team. Um, just in case there's any questions about that after the uh, session, um, we did think about. We'd actually planned this event before we knew about the dates for the shutdown. Um, we did think about, you know, whether we should cancel it, try and find some other dates and stuff. But actually, we thought in a way that it's quite nice to get everyone um, together while perhaps their ability to work was somewhat reduced um, to, to, to benefit from some of those discussions that we could have. So, um, yeah, uh, hopefully we can we can make the most of that opportunity and have some fruitful discussions. So. Uh, Recapping what, what Jasmine is all about then. So uh, these are some slides that I, I usually include in my um, Jasmine training workshop, our Jasmine training workshop that we go and deliver uh, for new users. And, uh, you know, Jasmine's all about um, supporting data analysis for NERC's environmental um, community. Um, it's large scale. It's about environmental science that, that's um, heavy on the data side. Um, it's, it's been tailored to the needs of the academic community, but obviously those needs evolve over time. So it's really important that the system um, and the, the, the tools and services evolve um, to support those. One of the key sort of parts of Jasmine has always been that it's co-located with the data. What do we mean by the data? The, um, there's two main parts to it really. There's the CEDAR archive. So um, that's NERC's uh, long-term curated archive of environmental data. Um, it grew out of the British Atmospheric Data Centre and the NERC Earth Observation Data Centre, um, but it's, it, it covers a lot of things now. And that's also part of the NERC Environmental Data Service now. 
So that's the curated data side of things. Um, the other part of it is what we call group workspaces. So these are um, essentially volatile user data that projects um, have an allocation of space where they can do stuff together. And sometimes the outputs of those, um, those projects find their way into the Cedar archive or some other data center in due course. But that's the purpose of having the compute next to the data is to facilitate both the, the large scale data analysis, but also that collaboration as well. Jasmine itself is a place where people come together and work together and, and, and do useful stuff. And I think it's fair to say that quite a lot of the, the, um, the activities that go on, um, you know, we get really nice feedback that Jasmine is pretty much the only place that, that some think some of those things can happen at those sorts of scales. Um, so, so that's really important. On the side of the data, we've then got um, uh, flexible compute um, capabilities. So for example, the Jasmine Community Cloud, where to some extent you can build your own um, uh, computing infrastructure um, for, for your sort of bespoke workflows, that kind of thing. So how do we do it? Uh, it's very much um, a, a cross-department thing. So myself and Adrian and, and some of the other guys you'll see around here, we're based in CEDAR, which is a division of RAL Space. And then the infrastructure team uh, is based within uh, SDFC scientific computing department. Um, but it was kind of jointly architected between those two people from those two departments. Um, but essentially, uh, SCD run the infrastructure and CEDAR runs the, or the Jasmine team within CEDAR runs the, the user facing side of Jasmine. So everyone was happy using Jasmine and getting on with their projects and stuff. And then, and then the pandemic came along and, and messed it all up. And this horrible virus sort of made us all go and um, work remotely and, and actually brought some new challenges. Amazingly, we managed to keep Jasmine running throughout that, um, down again to the hard work of the, the team in um, scientific computing to sort of keep everything online during that period. But it did change the way a lot of people worked. Um, and there was a certainly sort of interesting um, uh, time for us all. Um, so then uh, COVID kind of hopefully um, faded into the background. But while everyone was busy, um, Jasmine reached a sort of 10-year birthday. But it sort of passed without, without notice, really. Um, and, and we're now sort of 11 or even 12, I think, probably. So I think it's well worth celebrating the fact that Jasmine has been around for, you know, we, we've made it uh, to nearly 12 years old, I think, by my reckoning. Um, and I think that's really something worth celebrating. So hence, um, you know, drink receptions tonight. So, so do come along and, and, and share with us the, uh, the achievement of, of this. But it's also about bringing together the, the community that, that's um, developed around Jasmine. So let's have a look at some of the, um, the recent changes uh, that have, have taken place. We've had changes in, in the team, in, in the user communities that, that are um, in Jasmine, the services on Jasmine. The rest of the world has changed as well in ways far too depressing to, to even contemplate. So we won't bother talking about those, but let's concentrate on the, the ones more closer to home. Um, so, you know, as I say, people, people accessing Jasmine much more so from, from home rather than the university networks. Um, workflows are evolving. Um, there's much more use of the cloud. We've got capabilities to cater for um, artificial intelligence and machine learning type workflows now coming online. Um, also changes in, in, in the, sc the scale of the infrastructure. Um, it's a constant job to sort of refresh the infrastructure to maintain, let alone expand um, the capacity that, that's provided. Um, but also the mix of, of whether that should be in the sort of managed infrastructure versus the compute. Keeping the, the right staff um, or, or getting the right staff available to help run the service is a, is a constant challenge for us. And of course, all that costs money and the challenges of, of, of keeping um, the right level of funding um, coming is, is, uh, is always there. So on the team side, um, the Previous director, I know some of you for new, uh, Brian Lawrence. Um, so Jasmine was uh, to a large extent his his brainchild, um, and he in the latter part of his directorship, if you like, he he, he actually did that role about ten percent of his time, amazingly. Um, and in the latter part of that, he he lobbied for um, a full time director position to sort of help uh, uh, take Jasmine on a um, a more clearly mapped out strategy. So Adrian joined us um, just over a year ago um, in in that role. So we now have a full-time Jasmine director. 
Um, and as I say, we sort of um, we work across two departments here. So uh, we've got James and Christina here from the scientific computing department. Um, but on their side, they've also there's Sarah Summers, um, who uh, looks after the Lotus cluster. There's Marcello, who works on storage, and Kieran, who's, who's recently joined their team as well. And then on the user services side, um, so this is so I'm, I, I sort of uh, lead the, the user services side of um, Jasmine. And uh, you've got some of the, the faces involved there in their various roles. On both sides, in both of these departments, there's, there's actually quite a, a bigger bunch of people. Um, I've just highlighted um, some of the ones you may, you may see around today. I'm sure there's people I could have put on slide as well. But, um, so yeah, that there's on both sides, there's a lot more people than you see there. Um, on the CEDAR side, it's because our work on Jasmine overlaps significantly with the, the work of the CEDAR archive and all the services that go along with that. On the scientific computing side, um, it's the case that it overlaps with other things going on in um, economies of scale that, that about providing research infrastructures within scientific computing by STFC. Um, and also then there's the digital infrastructures team who literally run the, the machine room where Jasmine is housed. They're the ones who've been particularly uh, busy with all the, the power work as well. So there's a lot of people involved other than the ones you see here, but these are some of the, the key people, if you like. And hopefully, if you have some some chats with them over coffee and stuff, you'll, you'll, there'll be some good interactions there. So let's have a look now at some of uh, how the, um, some details of how the, the services have changed. Um, one thing uh, that some of you use is the um, uh, Jupyter Notebook service, which we run on Jasmine. So a recent change to this has been enabling uh, group workspace read and write access. I think that's now working, isn't it, Matt? Is that right? Yeah, okay. Um, you, there's also a shell um, option within that, so you can actually start up a, a bash shell um, to, to use within the notebook service. That's perhaps a, a way of interacting with Jasmine that you may not have come across. And we've also helped provide some additional information in the um, documentation about how to create custom um, virtual environments and bringing in additional packages. Um, so that's one thing. Um, on the uh, No Machine NX service, this is the um, sort of virtual desktop service that we provide. Um, so rather than just a pure terminal where you connect to Jasmine, this gives you a, a virtual desktop inside Jasmine. And that's particularly useful if you're using um, graphics intensive applications. So for example, if you're wanting to scroll through big satellite images, that kind of thing, do some image analysis, it's ideal for that kind of thing because it works more, more, much more efficiently um, using that system than trying to do it um, with, with just normal kind of X windows. We've added um, another server to the, to the three that existed already. So there's now four in that sort of little cluster of, um, of servers. So hopefully coping with the demand a bit better and various up version upgrades that should help that service remain a bit more stable. Um, this one hasn't happened yet, but it's disappearing soon. The, um, the, the old bugbear of needing to have a reverse DNS lookup on your network connection. Um, this should be disappearing with the move from CentOS 7 uh, to Rocky 9 Linux, uh, which will be happening sometime between now and the middle of next year. Um, so it hasn't happened yet, but that's something definitely that I know a lot of you will be um, pleased to hear. Um, one thing we've been trialing this year is um, the idea of multiple account types. So uh, there's now a documentation page which explains how, how we're, we're introducing this and we've got uh, basically a standard account like most people have, uh, but there's now shared and separately service accounts, um, each with a defined set of rules. Um, and this is based on user feedback, but um, this would be particularly useful for certain project, uh, projects to be able to have this. Uh, we've set this up as an initial trial. Um, so if you are involved with a project where you think this would be useful, have a look at the documentation page for that and, um, and let us know via the help desk. Um, and we will see if we can set you up. So give that a try. Um, <coughs> on the subject of accounts, <coughs> excuse me. And we also have um, a mechanism for setting up temporary training accounts now, um, which can be reconfigured with all the, um, the access that's needed for particular training events. Um, so we use these for the Jasmine training workshops when we go and deliver that in Leeds or online. And we're able to, to give people these um, accounts um, before the day so that everything's set up and hopefully those events run smoothly. Um, as there's, again, there's a help page about these. So if that's of interest, if, you, if you're running a training account that uses Jasmine 
if you're running a training event that uses Jasmine, um, you can actually borrow a set of training accounts. We've got a mechanism to be able to, to sort of um, spin those up and tear them down relatively easily now. So again, if that's of use to you, then, then please do get in touch. And yeah, so the, the Jasmine training events that, that, that happen, um, the Jasmine workshops, we've got, um, uh, the, there's a beginner's level and an advanced level. Um, we, we will try and run the, the beginner's ones uh, a few times a year. We've got one coming up next week um, just for a particular group, but we're hoping to run a, a wider access one in March next year. Um, and uh, that's a good chance to just get a kind of overview of all the different Jasmine services, a bit of a hands-on um, uh, experience of how it all works and uh, uh, st start to, to use some of the services like the, um, the batch cluster. Um, but as well as the ones we run ourselves, we're also involved in supporting um, training events that are rather run by groups that are using Jasmine or other groups. So for example, this is a, a hackathon that uh, Fatima and I and a few others um, helped out at recently in Cambridge in support of the um, NERC creating the digital environment um, program. And, and yeah, if, if groups have particular sort of tailored training needs that they need to um, discuss with us or as I say, want to borrow the, the training accounts, that's something that can be can be done. So on the information side, uh, we've recently um, uh, put up a new uh, format of the, the CEDA website, uh, but that's that's the sort of main source of news really for um, the CEDA around Jasmine. We, we kind of keep the two together because it's nice to have the, the service updates mixed in with stories of, of how people are using Jasmine and, and CEDA in interesting ways and tell you about the work we're doing as well as just the uh, this is up, this is down type of notices. Um, so we've got a new format for that website that's just re recently um, uh, gone up. And we did that just before the uh, downtime so that it stayed up, apart from one little glitch last week. Um, so yeah, that's, that's changed recently. There's also a status page on that um, website as well. So if you have a look at cedar.ac.uk now, uh, well, uh, there's a status page uh, where it's, you can actually have the JSON feed of that status page as well if you wanted to, to, to use that separately. Um, and that's something that we'll be trying to keep updated um, from now on with, with details about CEDA and Jasmine status. Um, the help documentation for Jasmine is uh, something that we as a team try and sort of keep as up to date as possible. Um, so we try and provide detailed information about how to use, how to get the best out of the services on, on Jasmine. Um, coupled with that, we write uh, the training materials that are used in the in the training events as well. <laughs> um, but a new thing that we've we've just um, we've just uh, got going really, and we, we're going to trial it with a couple of particular sort of discussions is the idea of um, discussion fora. It's something that people were asking for, uh, particularly in the wake of the um, uh, the GPU webinars that happened earlier in the year. So um, using GitHub um, discussions as, as, a, as a trial platform, we'll see how that goes. If that doesn't work, we can, we can try something else. But um, I think there's a session tomorrow, uh, possibly about the, um, the cloud portal, which I think we'll, we'll mention that. So uh, I won't say too much about it now. Another thing that's changed is kind of uh, over the years, how we how we manage our own services, um, the services that, that provide access to, to CEDA and Jasmine in various ways. So within this sort of software development group that we've got within CEDA, we've moved to um, uh, a sort of method of continuous integration and deployment, um, which, is, which is great from the point of view of being able to kind of uh, de-risk. Uh, if you make smaller changes in a more continuous way, you de-risk the, the sort of, um, introducing those changes and um, hopefully requires less of a big bang every now and again. Um, it's, it's more sort of incremental changes that some of you won't even notice. Um, we've also moved to containerizing a lot of our services. This really helps in terms of making more efficient, dense use of the compute power that's that's used to, to run those services, has other benefits too. Um, and uh, like with the CEDA website, you know, we're, we're thinking, starting to think more about the location of where particular services should be. So for example, um, the CEDA and Jasmine websites themselves are now hosted off of Jasmine um, so that they remain up when, when there's, there's system issues and stuff so that we can still keep, keep in contact with you. And I think that's, that's a thing that's probably worth thinking about in some of the discussions is um, particularly on the resilience side, um, um, you know, there are things Jasmine does well, there are things Jasmine doesn't do so well. 
there are um, uh, homes for particular types of services. There are probably better homes for some types of services elsewhere. Um, so it's worth sort of having some of that in mind when you're um, involved in those discussions. And then the infrastructure itself, of course, uh, we men mentioned that um, it's a kind of rolling program of, of renewing uh, uh, the, the hardware as it, as it um, ages. We need to replace it from that point of view. We need to replace it because we need to expand capacity. We need to add new services like the GPU cluster, for example, and, and adapting to the needs of our, our user community. So that's a sort of continuous job. Um, and that's something we, uh, we work hard on every year. Um, so that's given you a little bit of a flavor of some of the recent changes. Um, you will hear in a, little, in a little bit more detail, so I won't steal their thunder by going through all the detail now, but I think in the session tomorrow about um, some of the new user services, you'll hear about some of the things listed there, the cloud portal and the, um, the DAS gateway and stuff. Um, just to mention the, um, actually, yeah, we'll, I'll, I'll leave those for those sessions, but um, things that are also happening, you can see on the right-hand side. So over the past few years, we've introduced um, a few of these things. So there's the, the projects portal, which is the place where we gather all the information about project requirements in terms of you know needing a group workspace or a cloud tenancy with some details of your project and the scale of the things you need and the dates and that sort of thing. So we can have a better view of, of, of the sort of um, the set of projects across Jasmine and manage the applications for them a bit better. So that's that's been in use for over a year or so now. Um, the, over the past uh, couple of years, we've migrated from a previous version of VIO, that's the um, VMware integrated OpenStack cloud platform, um, to version 7. Um, so that was a big change that happened towards the beginning of, of this year, and that was just was completed. Um, part of the hardware refresh process also involves migrating some of the archive data and the user data sometimes. So sometimes, occasionally, there's some fairly big storage migrations to complete. They need to happen every now and again. And um, there's there's some work that's been going on to sort of improve the, um, the process for uh, notifying users when their accounts are due for re renewal um, so that people don't kind of drop off and lose access. Some things that we've got in progress, um, we've got the, uh, the object store portal. So this is like a an interface to enable you to generate um, access tokens for using the object store. Um, I think that's that's very near um, being ready for, for, for users to access. So that's, that's great news. Um, we've been working with the, the NERC uh, digital solutions team um, on uh, a sort of pilot project, if you like, for what's called TREs or trusted research environments. Um, whether it's feasible and in what form we could operate something that would um, uh, cater for uh, sensitive data types on Jasmine. And it's not something we currently do, um, but we've got a little pilot going for the sort of you know, trying to shake down some of the problems with that, how we might approach it in the future, even if the solution that we initially got now um, is, isn't what we, we would um, keep in the future, but it's uh, to learn from it. Um, coming soon will be, uh, we need to move to a new version of the Globus endpoint. So if you're, if you're a Globus user, um, just look out for some notices about that. As soon as the conference is over, I'm going to get right onto that um, and uh, get a new a new version of that um, up and ready. We're working on providing you with um, better metrics and dashboards. Um, we've done quite a lot of work in the background over this over the past two years, but um, probably not so much that's visible to you. And we want to try and, try and sort of uh, round those off so that um, you've got a better view of the system status. And uh, I think I'm right in saying that the Slurm upgrade has happened as part of the uh, the downtime this week. So that was an essential Slurm upgrade that needed to happen, moving between different versions of the Slurm software. So uh, hopefully that's uh, that's going to be complete by the time that's done as well. Um, there's a whole long list of things to come, but probably one that you probably want to know about is um, that the, the sort of default operating system, if you like, of Jasmine for the past couple of years has been CentOS 7. So we're going to be moving to um, Rocky Linux 9. Um, and that change will need to be uh, done by the middle of next year. So there will need to be um, a bit of a plan for that in terms of moving over to uh, systems over to that. There you go. There's the work now. So some of you might be familiar with this uh, 
diagram, which is uh, what we use in some of the training materials. It's kind of a UR here map for Jasmine um, and helps kind of give a bit of a, a view of, of the different sort of uh, parts of Jasmine. So in, on the top layer here, we've got the kind of access services, um, the accounts portal, the projects portal, the login machines and transfer machines and stuff that you're all familiar with. The dotted outlines are the things that are external facing, um, which just helps sort of identify the bits that you can access sort of directly from outside. Um, I've updated the diagram recently to show that the notebook service is actually um, available from outside as well, so that's worth uh, bearing in mind. Some of these things are very nearly ready, like I say, the object store uh, access token portal is going to be um, up and running very very soon, as is the sort of discussions forum up here. So down the left-hand side, we've got kind of information services, um, and then the different layers of things, as I say, access services, then we've got compute services in the middle here, so we've got the sign machines, which are uh, uh, scientific analysis, virtual machines, and the notebook service. And then the batch compute um, with the Slurm scheduler. And we've got CPU nodes, compute nodes, and then GPU nodes added more recently in the... Um, so the CPU cluster is called um, Lotus, and the GPU cluster we've called Orchid. Um, so those are, those are there. And then there's a, a stack of software that we maintain that is available throughout that whole um, stack of software. So that's another thing that we do. On the right-hand side here in the green, we've got the Jasmine Community Cloud. And this is where you'll find um, two types of tenancy that, that we're able to, as a cloud tenant, you can sort of choose between. So you've got a managed tenancy, which is essentially your own version of a, of a uh, scientific analysis VM. Um, but you can choose who can access it and you can choose to, to um, redeploy or restart it. It's under your control. Um, but essentially, it's a pre-canned version. It's just a, an image of one of those um, scientific analysis VMs that, that is for your community. Uh, or the alternative is an external tenancy where you can choose from one of a, um, a set of um, VM templates. I think there's um, Ubuntu or CentOS 7. Um, and you can deploy those and um, build services from those uh, to your needs. Um, on top of that, there's also the cluster as a service or CAS capability, which uh, provides more of a sort of set of building blocks that allows you to um, build, say, uh, your own little um, computing infrastructure, whether it's a, a mini Slurm cluster or um, use some of those building blocks to use like an identity management service and various other stuff that can happen in, inside those um, external tenancies. So you can run your own little, um, uh, or not so little in, in some cases, um, compute infrastructure there with your own services to serve your own community. And we have quite a wide um, set of users who, who use these for all sorts of different things. Um, and that's uh, that's something we're very keen to sort of think about the future of that side of Jasmine, because um, it's probably probably outgrown um, the way it's currently provided. So we want to look at some, some new alternatives. Um, down here on the right-hand side, we've got what we call the data transfer zone. So this is... Um, physically part of the network as, as, as close as possible to the sort of site, uh, you know, the RAL site um, uh, perimeter um, in, in network wise. So to get that highest performance we can, and we've got various um, high performance transfer services in there, um, like Globus, like I mentioned. This is also where we cite the S3 proxy. So this is what's used for accessing the, the object storage from outside. Um, then coming back across the bottom here, we've got uh, the uh, joint data migration app, which is uh, for moving data between um, disk and tape. This is shortly due to be replaced by a new thing called the Nearline um, Data Store. Um, I think Neil's going to be talking, or one, one of the guys, Jack, probably, is going to be talking about that tomorrow. Um, so we're really excited to hear about the developments with that. That should be a big improvement on in terms of capability and usability of um, being able to move stuff to and from tape which we're really keen to provide you with because the ability to do that helps you manage what's on spinning disk, all these different types of storage here. And this is what is, is expensive and costs a lot of energy, whereas putting stuff on tape um, is less so. So underlying all of that, we've got various types of storage services in this layer here. So we've got home directories, um, workspaces, transfer cache, and scratch storage, which is used as kind of uh, temporary storage for the um, for the Lotus cluster, and those those rely on these different types of storage media at the bottom. Um, so not not much has changed in terms of the different types that we provide, 
Um, but as I say, we've been doing some some hardware refresh on those and, and plans to obviously um, keep things keep things moving in that area. So moving on, um, just to put a few sort of numbers on things to get a bit of a scale for the a feel for the scale of the operations. So in terms of the sort of number of users, we've been growing steadily. I think we're just over 1,800 users now with around just over 300 projects. Um, so uh, that's been sort of growing steadily over time. In terms of usage of the, the Lotus cluster, the batch cluster, we typically get between four and five million CPU hours per month. Um, the cluster is, is of a size of around, um, it should be 18 and a half thousand cores, not nodes. Um, but uh, that that's, gives you an idea of the scale. And, and we've currently got eight sign machines. Those are the, um, the scientific analysis servers. Some of them are physical, some of them are virtual, some of them are high memory, so for different purposes. And then with the introduction of the GPU cluster, we've got um, obviously a bunch of uh, GPU nodes as well, which are available through the same scheduling system, but uh, it's with a sort of bespoke um, queue. And then on the cloud side, I think we're up to about 60 cloud tenancies now. Um, majority are external tenancies, but a handful of uh, managed tenancies and then a few funny ones in between that are sort of special ones with particular configurations. But yeah, of order 60 um, projects using the, the, the uh, Jasmine Cloud now. And on the storage side, um, we have uh, added some more, uh, so there's different types of um, system, obviously there's the Scale out file system or soft, other people might know that as Quobyte. Um, so we've got roughly uh, 50 petabytes of that now. Um, and then about eight petabytes of Panassus, a, a parallel file system, which is used for the scratch storage and some other specialist volumes. On the object storage, I think we've got roughly uh, eight petabytes of that now. So that's, that's storage that you can access anywhere, but in sort of put and get mode, it's not really storage that you can mount in terms of a normal file system. Um, but that's going to be used heavily as part of the, um, the NLDS and the aligned data store um, cache. So when you come to uh, putting and getting your data, that's what you'll interact with rather than the tape itself. And talking of tape, um, I think the, the current tape mounting is around sort of 90 petabytes in size at the moment. Um, so uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of headroom at the moment for, for, for some, some more use of the tape system. That's what we're really trying to encourage. And then on the side of that, we've got, as I say, this, this solid state storage for user home directories. And uh, we introduced a while ago these um, SMF volumes or small files volumes, because uh, the solid state storage copes a lot better with um, small files. Um, so if your group project requires a lot of that kind of storage, then you can talk to us and have one of these provided for your, for your group workspace. Now, the other type that we mentioned there is just the block storage, which is used in the um, in the cloud mainly, and also just some specialist applications like databases. And all that kind of consumes roughly, we've been doing some monitoring of, of this over the past couple of years, um, around 300 kilowatts. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of net zero implications of Jasmine in some of the um, discussion sessions, but um, that's something that uh, we want to keep a close eye on from now on. Um, and we'll want to look at ways of how we can at least limit, if not reduce, um, Jasmine's uh, consumption, but also other things we can do in the sort of net zero arena um, to help. Just some more facts and figures in terms of um, group workspaces. So um, sort of in terms of headline usage of storage, the Cedar archive um, uses around 23 petabytes of, of storage. And on the group workspace side, I think it's around the same amount of storage is allocated for group workspaces with around 15 petabytes of actual data stored within those. But of course, in order to be useful as workspace storage, you've got to have that headroom to be able to work in. So that's why um, not all of it is used at any one time. Now that just gives you some idea of the scale. Um, you'll be aware of the different um, consortia that we have for um, kind of dividing Jasmine into different community um, areas by, by science domain. And this gives you an idea of the sort of number of projects that, that are in each of those um, science domains. So the atmospheric science is, is the biggest, really, followed by the Earth Observation and Climate, and then the Joint Weather and Climate Research Program, um, ocean and shelf seas, polar science, that sort of thing. 
So that gives you an idea of the sort of community usage of Jasmine. And again, that's the number of projects down here in the bottom. We've got how much space they're allocated versus how much space they're actually using, um, just to give a flavor for the actual usage. But in terms of the actual, um, the, the sizes of, of projects that we, that we have, the vast majority of group workspaces are in this kind of 50, I think it's uh, one to 50 terabyte range, um, but quite a lot in, in the next sort of bucket above that, so 50 to 100, uh, but quite a long tail after that, with some, some of, you know, about a petabyte in size. So some, some very large projects, but the vast majority are around this kind of size here, so um, it's just of interest. Um, and then, yeah, just an idea of the kind of projects that we've got using Jasmine. Um, this, this is a, a, a small subset. Of course, when I was putting together these slides and was looking around for some nice screenshots, I was rather limited in my ability to find nice screenshots last week. Um, so, uh, but also it reminded me that this is a really good opportunity to try and get you guys to, to tell us about the things you're working on, because this is, this is the kind of thing we need um, to put, put, put together our um, information about you know, what people are doing on Jasmine. That really helps in sort of spreading the message about what Jasmine can do and helping with the continued funding. But um, yeah, we've got some, some examples here. I'm sure you're familiar with some of them. So this is the, the Comet group. They were looking at uh, how um, the Earth's surface deforms um, with earthquakes. Um, we've got people doing um, biodiversity type studies. This is actually the uh, British Trust for Ornithology. There's a group there that's using Jasmine. There's, this, uh, there's a big um, state of nature study. Um, I know CEH are heavily involved in the I think at the last Jasmine conference, even there was a, a talk about the um, sort of biodiversity survey that they were doing, which was fascinating. Um, there's a group within uh, RAL Space, uh, the Remote Sensing Group, who do lots of work on uh, monitoring different gas um, compositions of the atmosphere. Um, and they've got a visualization tool, uh, which they make public on top of their group workspace on Jasmine. Um, so that's that's something that like a service that they run on top of Jasmine, on top of a the analysis that they do. And then this is um, the Primavera project, which has been one of the, the big projects looking at um, high resolution climate models, which has now come to an end. I think there's a talk by um, the Canary Group, which is uh, going to be uh, actually no, the, the, the Erie project that follows on from that. So, anyway, lots, big range of projects, more than I could possibly cover here. But the thing to say is please do keep that information coming in because we're always really keen to hear about what you're doing and, and it really helps. So, um, so that's that. Moving for time. Okay. So plans for the future. Um, every year, when when we when we learn um, the sort of rough scale and timing of what funding is going to be available, um, we, we look at our our needs in terms of refreshing the storage and work out what's feasible to 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 target in terms of procurement of, of hardware and other things that we that we need to keep the system running. Last year, we really focused on storage. And this year, I think it's fair to say the focus will be on um, the compute, so refreshing some of the latest batch compute hardware and some of the, um, the Jasmine core network. Um, so that's going to be uh, what we focus on. Uh, so we're putting together a, a plan for that right now. Um, sort of looking, looking further forward, um, we want to do um, a, we want to have a better look at how we procure what, what, what storage systems would make sense for Jasmine going forward. So we're trying to get underway a project to look at that in more detail. Uh, the, the sort of offerings, the market, if you like, has changed over the past 10 years quite considerably, as have the types of work that people want to use Jasmine for. So we need to keep in step with that and make sure that we can um, provide both the types and the scale and the, all the other attributes you can think of, um, including cost and energy as well. Um, so there's lots of things to consider in terms of that, that sort of forward look on storage. That's quite a major thing. Um, we've also uh, had a consultancy running recently to look at how Jasmine can serve um, new communities. And the guys who are involved in that are with us uh, today, which is great. Um, so we've yet to fully digest uh, the, the, your, your report, but we're, 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 we're going to be right into it as soon as this is over. And that's going to be quite important, I think, for us to, to try and work out, you know, where would be best to focus our efforts in terms of um, broadening Jasmine's user base. What are there particular communities that would benefit from from using Jasmine? How would it work? All that kind of stuff. 
Um, so that's that's uh, really important. I mentioned also we're looking at how best we can um, provide the right sort of Jasmine cloud. Um, uh, so that's another thing that we're, we're going to be looking at real soon. Um, there's lots of, as ever, there's lots of major projects um, taking shape. Um, the EO Data Hub is a major activity that Seed is involved with. EO Sys, I know I was talking to someone earlier who's involved in that as well. Um, so major projects in the um, Earth observation domain. Obviously, there's the NERC Environmental Data Service as well. So Cedar Archive is part of that, but obviously it's underpinned by by Jasmine. All of the Cedar services run on Jasmine, so it's really there's a really close link there. Um, yeah. So that's an idea of some of the things we're going to be doing, and then also some of the challenges that we're going to face in doing that. So we've mentioned net zero. Um, hopefully, some of the discussions in the session uh, to follow will will um, give us some some good. Uh, ideas about what, what could happen in that area. Um, we talked about um, trying to sort of uh, write down or clarify a bit more what Jasmine's operating model should be. Um, you know, are the requirements and the expectations for how Jasmine operates the right ones? Are we providing the right service for the community? What are the options? You know, um, yeah, there's lots of, lots of different options there, all with different price tags um, and, and scales, that sort of thing. But we also have to be conscious of, of, of needing to accommodate a broadening user base in that as well. Um, so lots of challenges there. Um, and then just in terms of the scale, you know, we're already sort of getting towards the limit of, of the, um, the data center that we're currently housed in. Um, there's a new one coming online, but it won't be available for a, a little while yet. So you know, what are the practical limits to actually the, the Jasmine service that we currently provide? Um, what's practical, what's not? Um, the funding is all, also uh, an ongoing challenge. Um, it tends to be variable. It tends to be a little bit uncertain until quite late in the year, but for reasons beyond our control and beyond NERC's control even. Um, so that's that's quite a big challenge for, for the Jasmine management team is kind of trying to work within that to, to have a, a good enough plan looking forward, um, but at the same time, buying things that are the best value for money for the services that, that we need to run Jasmine. And of course, all this happens with trying to fit the requirements of a probably changing requirements of a changing community. Um, and, you know, we mentioned the, the sort of uh, trusted research environment, the idea of sensitive data. It's just one example of, of a sort of uh, a new facet of the service that we might need to think about providing. I'm sure there are others. Um, so again, it's another chance to sort of hear from, uh, from you, but also looking more widely um, in some of these consultancies about um, what's needed and what we can do about it. So that brings me uh, roughly to the end. So um, yeah, it's really great to see you all. Um, it's really nice to, to have one of these again after, after so long physically. Um, do join us for, for drinks and dinner tonight. As I say, it's great to sort of celebrate that Jasmine's now been around over 10 years, uh, which is good. But also, yeah, learn from what others have been up to. Share your experiences. Please do send us um, your your sort of impact stories. How has Jasmine helped you and what you're doing? What what impact has, has that science activity had? Um, I would also say try and include a mention of Jasmine in your in any publicity and news items that you do, you know, any, any communications that you do, because that it helps sort of um, attract recognition for Jasmine. Um, and that's always welcome. Um, but just just to finish here, yeah, Jasmine's all about collaboration. So um, we want it to be less of a sort of provider-consumer relationship. It kind of grew out of a community need and a community activity. And I think that's one of the nice aspects of it. So we're keen to maintain that, really. Um, it is a community collaboration platform, and that obviously involves you guys getting involved and taking part in the discussion so that we can help provide um, all the things you need. So, yeah, please do get involved. And, um, yeah, enjoy the conference, and uh, thank you very much. If not, I guess we can just um, ask for any other questions quickly before we, we move on to the next session. So to be far away if you've got anything you want to ask. That's, that's an intermittent one again, so I think we're okay. That's great timing, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you.
just a, a slightly random one. I've always wondered, is Jasmine an acronym? And if so, what does it stand for? It, it, yeah, good question. It, it was originally the, um, it was a bit contrived. It was the uh, Joint Analysis System Meeting E Infrastructure Needs. But I think, um, yeah, everyone's forgotten about that now and it's easier just to say Jasmine. So <laughs> it's not something we'll make a big deal of. But <laughs> okay, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll hand over to. Um, oh, I'm Thank you. You um, explained that you, 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 there's more of a focus now on object stores. How does that then relate to the CDR archives? Most of them are sort of net CDF files, and do they work? Are, are you able to use those with object stores? Are you planning to remain with block storage? Are there any plans to sort of retool the archives to other formats? I'm just looking for Neil in the audience. <laughs> it's, no stuff. it's just like brilliant. <laughs> Okay, yeah, no, so th there's actually, um, uh, so yeah, object storage is much more of a sort of put and get thing. Um, we're involved, well, the CEDA group is involved in um, some work uh, about sort of how to use object stores intelligently for particular data formats, net CDF being one of them. Um, so yeah, if Neil was here, I would ask you to tell him, ask him to tell you about this um, thing called Kachunk. Um, which I think um, is, is something that really helps in that space. Um, I don't know all the technical details myself, but maybe we can um, make sure that that's, or maybe, can we get that a microphone? Thanks, Jesse. Uh, so I work for a company called Stack HPC. We've been um, working with Ryan Lawrence on a, um, an Excalibur funded project. Uh, which is looking at active storage and so what this does is well the idea of this is that so one of the problems with s3 is that you because it's a because you either range gets aside which are quite messy to use you either pull or push an entire object um, but we've been working on this project called active storage as part of excalibur which aims to push some compute into the storage so you can do like so it defines an API to do simple reductions in the storage system before you pull the data over the WAN. And so the theory is that you're transferring less data and so your analysis takes less time. So it may be that that's something we could look to put in front of Jasmine's object store as well. At some yep. point. 